Just waiting for Melissa to come back. Great. So you'll have this mic, right? You'll stand here. Okay. Okay, so um, hello everyone. And welcome to the session on knowledge sharing advocacy and more precisely on new paths, new ways to solve and deal with new challenges. Uh, my name is Alek Tarkovsky. I am co-director at Open Future, where I think tank for the digital commons. I'm also on the board of Creative Commons and on the foundation board of a Polish NGO called Centrum Cyfrowe. Uh, Melissa, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Melissa Hegeman, and um, I am transitioning the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which first defined open access to research, into an organization which will advocate for the equitable development of open access. And I'm also a fellow with Open Future. So um, this session will sort of have two parts. Part of it is information sharing. We're running a process on looking for these new paths and we want to share, we're, we're midway and we want to share with you where we are, what, are is, what is our current thinking, what are the outcomes. The second part is a bit more important. It treats the first part as food for thoughts and we want to hear your ideas. Uh, I see quite a lot of uh, faces I know and I know you're working on similar things. You share a similar sense that we need to both talk more about uh, shared advocacy positions, but also that there is a time where things are changing and we need to adapt. So we really want to uh, encourage you to speak up and tell us what you think. So usually I see at Wikimania, the prompt is, does anyone have questions? Here the prompt is, does anyone have answers? Okay, keep that in mind. So, so what was our aim? As I said, we feel there are new challenges that impact knowledge sharing. This is, in general, at Open Future, a lot of the work we want to do. Uh, we're not saying everything needs to change, but we want to pay attention to the changes and want to understand how advocates might work together to set up new advocacy agendas. This, we'll be talking about the process that is currently done together by us, by BOAI, also by Spark, uh, which is a US-based advocacy organization that has been a champion of open access. I'm sure a lot of you know about Spark, also Spark Europe. Um, but I want to quickly mention previous work we did, which was a starting point. We did this report called Shifting Tides. Uh, it has a subtitle, The Open Movement at the Turning Point. It was based on interviews with the lot with 20 people some of you I think are in the room who are movement leaders but also do advocacy work and we wanted to understand sort of how they see openness whether it is changing um, we identified um, in this report we didn't get to the point where we had clear um, new thoughts around advocacy, but I think we had a very clear sense of this shifting terrain, this the title. We heard in this report that there's a new need for new voices in the movement, need for new narratives that fuel advocacy, need to sometimes reconsider relevance. People were often saying, oh, I start to have doubts whether the issues I still care about, openness, digital commons, knowledge sharing, free knowledge, in the bigger picture, do people, the other stakeholders care about them and this worries me. And there's a need to sort of ma maintain our shared work. But as I said, and this is why I consider this was just preliminary, we didn't get, we thought we will hear more about these ideas on advocacy, they weren't there. So, um, uh, we, and, and this is a good quote, which I think kind of fueled our thinking. First of all, we need to be looking forward. I think we often work with relatively short agendas here. The idea is look forward five years, maybe even uh, 10, build a vision, but also this needs to be collective. Um, so as a next step, we thought, okay, we want to drill down a bit more on advocacy. And uh, Melissa, you will say uh, about this process. Thanks, Alec. So last year, I think it was like last November when Alec came to DC, Alec, Heather Joseph of Spark and I began conversations around developing a process and a series of convenings around looking at these new challenges. So since that time in uh, June and July of this year, we held three virtual workshops um, looking at the challenges. And this is leading to an in-person convening that will take place uh, next month in Lisbon. And this will be f followed by a community consultation leading towards the development of shared advocacy agendas. 
Now, as we were beginning to try to identify and narrow down the challenges which we'd be um, focusing on, the overarching um, challenge which we are facing now is equity. And so instead of having one out of, let's say, four workshops focused on this, we decided to have this blended into the, the three challenges which we, are, which we identified. So equity is included in all of the discussions which we have been having around privacy and surveillance, the deployment of AI and research and education, and the platformization of research and further concentration of research infrastructures. So our first um, virtual workshop uh, took place in June, and um, we had probably around 30 participants, and we were looking at privacy and surveillance, um, specifically focused on the erosion of privacy and knowledge sharing, and knowledge sharing systems, um, and what risks this poses to academic freedom, research integrity, and uh, equitable access to information. So there's a lot of detail in all these slides, so I won't go into um, each of them, but including some of the main themes that we looked at um, was uh, the impact on research and education of privacy and surveillance. And um, uh, here, we were uh, concerned that the impact of privacy and surveillance on research and education um, and discussed how researchers may self-censor or avoid pursuing certain lines of inquiry due to fears of surveillance and data, mine, and data misuse. And similarly, in educational settings, um, there was a fear of intrusive monitoring of technologies and data collection practices, which can stifle intellectual ex 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 exploration and create a climate of distrust. So in terms of the potential solutions which we surface, um, during this discussion. One was around um, contract negotiations and vendor selection. And here we discuss using contract negotiations to demand greater privacy protections and ethical data practices from vendors. And there was also a suggestion to advocate for incorporating ethical considerations into vendor selection processes and going beyond cost and functionality in these negotiations. So some of the key takeaways from this discussion um, were that all of our participants really felt there was an urgent need um, for collective action um, in a proactive approach, and that we should concentrate our strategies on mitigating risks and promoting a more equitable and privacy-respecting knowledge-sharing landscape. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alec for the AI discussions. You can stay there if you want, and I can speak okay. from this side. Um, the topic of AI, by the way, I want to say uh, I'm sort of proud that we didn't decide to do a process that was described as knowledge sharing advocacy and AI, because I think this is a bit of a mood we are in that often uh, we decide this is the driving issue of today. I don't I think it's true. So we're doing a bit of a, maybe I don't need to say it, maybe it's clear to you, but I want to highlight it. I think it's important to work with other issues. Mm -hmm. It has been also helpful. Spark really has been leading some very interesting work in exploring these issues. And the ones they started with is surveillance in the academic mm -hmm. setting, which has been helpful that we could um, build on that as well. Right. So with, with AI I, um, and the challenges, the deployment of these technologies again in the spaces where knowledge sharing is relevant, relevant in the field of research and education. If you're following the debate, the Wikimedia movement has been having, I assume this will not be um, very new, still in the later part, we'll be curious to hear that this was mainly discussed in the context of higher education, research institutions, these were the people, maybe we should have mentioned that they were mainly the experts we were discussing this with. Um, so one of the important contexts, of course, here is scholarly publishing, and one of the key issues is um, uh, the issue of possible data extraction um, and as an issue that uh, is really key to advocates who have been working on things like sharing academic journals, uh, sharing uh, scientific data, uh, this suddenly becomes the big question. One of the questions, of course, is, is this anything new? Uh, maybe the um, 
these uh, practices are not just related um, to AI. Another issue that was obviously discussed in this is a bit separate sort of copyright law aspects. I think it's interesting how the AI conversation brings back some copyright discussions. After probably around 10 years where I personally thought, oh, pff, not much to discuss, the copyright wars are finished. We, of course, still have some problems, a lot maybe, but they're very well identified. There's, uh, we know what work needs to be done. Here, suddenly, there's a new conversation. We heard very strong voices uh, signaling that they think there are big limitations to how we can use copyright tools to deal with AI issues, especially issues that are sort of not copyright issues, like ethics, bias. That, that was signaled, I think it's a big thing that needs to be um, explored. Potential solutions, one, is to work more on data governance. So basically, and I think this is interesting, people were saying our standard model, where we basically say, well, we would like it to be openly licensed, um, and that's it. Uh, it ne we need to build upon it. There's probably more that needs to be done, and possibly even licensing itself needs to be reconsidered. And obviously, I think this is nothing new, but it's good that it's um, mentioned. Transparency is, in general, an important issue. And ethical data practices, it's not different in the field of uh, education and research. Um, and um, so, so key takeaways, well, that we do need to address this issue. I guess that's not very, <laughs> that's pretty obvious. And, um, and it was clearly seen that using the lens, as Melissa mentioned, of equity and transparency uh, works well in this space. And also the topic of community ownership. We'll come back to it in a moment in the field of platforms. But I think this is a very interesting discussion. On one way, and again, I would be curious how this is seen from a Wikimedia perspective, where community ownership of the whole let's call it stack, is obvious. Here we're discussing it in a context where this is not obvious. And I think it's important to say community ownership doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as non-corporate solutions. I think this is more, and, and we can discuss it. So the last topic was platformization. And I think the interesting thing is that by this time, in our third session, we could start to see how everything weaves together. Um, and again, this reconfirmed the sense that we don't need to talk just about AI. I think this idea of talking about platforms is very important. Again, Spark has been doing very interesting work in this regard. Basically, their argument is the organizations, for instance, that we thought of as publishers are now becoming data platforms. The same companies are changing their tactics in a way. They're starting to reuse a different resource, not the intellectual property in the shape of, let's say, articles. That's, not, that's still a big discussion, but also the data. Data, for instance, on the usage of this content. In higher education, this means also data, for instance, on students and academics. And these were the, um, the big questions for this session. And I think this is the session where we most strongly talked about the big topic that I think we see in big policy debates, monopoly, concentrations of power, imbalance of power. This is the session where we really felt it is demonstrated that we need to address this issue. Again, data exploitation and privacy obviously are discussed in the context of platforms, so they sort of reinforce the findings from the previous um, two sessions. What are potential solutions? I think there was a lot of discussion on how contracts function, contracts between academic institutions and the um, providers of platforms. The other very interesting topic was uh, that the topic of infrastructure emerges. So I don't know how much you follow this. There's a growing, I think, interest in infrastructure. There's a whole discussion now on digital infrastructures, on open digital infrastructures, on public digital infrastructures. Um, it's good to see that it's relevant for the um, sort of knowledge sharing community. And um, um, of the key takeaways, the last one I think was sort of most interesting to me, but I think it's a very strong line to follow, local solutions. There were strong voices basically saying that in the end, there is a big problem with the cloud, with the cloud and its role uh, on the academia, and on education, uh, there was a very interesting comment that said there was a time when really it felt like academic and research institutions will be reliant on local solutions, on much smaller, much more also community-owned, and maybe we need to come back 
to this thinking. Mm -hmm. um, wrapping up, uh, before we open the conversation, just to reiterate uh, and to show this process has next steps, we will have a meeting sort of to in person close up some of this conversation and to be able to propose some more precise ideas, especially on next step, on, on shared steps that can be taken, which will then open to community consultations, which we hope maybe you will want to take part in. And ultimately, our goal that's going to take more steps is really come to this idea that there's a shared advocacy agenda uh, with organizations collaborating and leading on, on specific challenges and an agenda that sort of frames these new challenges as relevant for knowledge sharing. Thanks, Alec. So we would love, as Alec mentioned, um, to get your reactions to these um, challenges and this process, and specifically if there are other issues, um, other emerging challenges which you think um, really play a role in shaping the future of knowledge sharing, which we should also be, be addressing. And maybe one thing I'll add also, uh, we, we made, I think, an effort and we succeeded in, in having this as a global conversation. Mm -hmm. That's one of the advantages of doing this online, that we had people, Australia was difficult due to time zones. But we did. But we did nevertheless, <laughs> to, thanks to, uh, you know, Fiona Brave, Bradley uh, joining at 11 o'clock at night. Fiona getting up, yes, yeah. <laughs> staying up late. But geography also, I think we managed to bridge the gaps. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. this is also a very international meeting. So also, if if any of you want to say how this looks from your perspective, from a regional one, uh, even if you want to reiterate this point but give it the local flavor, that, that would be great. Mm -hmm. You want to go first? Uh, so you'll get the microphone. Please also maybe introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Pia Desimon from the Open Data CH Association. Uh, you have work, uh, worked uh, on the scientific and research system, and I guess like here we are at a conference that is kind of focusing a lot also on encyclopedias, but have you also been looking at the media journalism system and how it's evolving over the past 10 years with digital transformation? Yeah. Um, the quick answer is in this process not, yeah. uh -huh. but maybe I can uh, return the question. Do you, do you want to say just a bit more? I assume you've been thinking. About well, I was. What you're thinking? I have always seen like uh, the media journalism system and the research, whatever, not. like all all the all the nonfiction publications uh, of this world, like as inputs to Wikipedia and the likes, because we re rely on, on sources, right? Mm -hmm. And if those systems are changing or are being broken, or if there's a big divide uh, across the world, this will affect the encyclopedia system, what we kind of here uh, tend to, to call like the, no the, the shared knowledge space, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I would suggest that we really need to look at all of these input systems, otherwise if they break down, we'll have a, a problem down the road. And I think it's also a conversation which would immediately bring the topic of disinformation, which, for instance, didn't appear here as much. Y but yeah, I think disinformation uh, is a big topic here. It's like with terrorism. Mm -hmm. Like, my freedom fighter is your terrorist. Mm -hmm. So it's a tricky issue and we have mm -hmm. to maybe be a bit more creative than so far to actually address it also in this movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. We asked, I will admit it, at least two persons to uh, contribute to this conversation. Maybe I, <laughs> we can <laughs> ask one of you for now to speak up. Ivan, do you want to uh, share your thoughts? I really wanted to have your feedback because I know in your work, you work a lot in the commons, but also you work with digital rights. So I'm curious how you see this. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm Ivan Martinez from Mexico. Uh, I'm a digital rights defender and a free knowledge activist. Uh, thanks for the invitation. 
I think uh, one of the first things that I'm usually sharing with other persons that are interested or uh, uh, persons who are stakeholders in this process, like education, like culture, like all the relation around that topics, is that uh, the awareness and recognition of the fact that editing, promoting, spreading the word and uh, protecting free knowledge is a way of activism in the middle of a more imbalanced internet, uh, because the internet is a new source of richness and concentration of power. So when you are defending or you are uh, working projects inside this ecosystem, you are directly promoting rights and directly promoting uh, like a island that we are now because all the internet is taken by powers, the same powers of all the history. So one of the strategies that I actually work in in Mexico is that the, the awareness to educational and cultural sectors that uh, are they, they are part of a new way of or, or make important or remark to them that they are part of, of a way of ensuring rights. Uh, for an example, uh, I'm working closely with the librarian sector in Mexico, which is a natural ally in many countries. But I think in Mexico we have like the uh, growing interest of librarians to uh, work in topics of activism and uh, advocacy, essentially. Uh, we had a discussion, a hard discussion about a new law of libraries in Mexico, which has like a a first historical sentence of the Supreme Court of Mexico that uh, talks about the, the importance of ensuring the, the right to access to education and culture through the books, for an example. Uh, so I think the, the librarian sector is more and more activity active within the, the, the vision of human rights because many persons or key persons in the sect of that sectors are not exactly consciousness or not have the awareness that they are part of of, of defending human rights too. So I think it's very important to share and, and transmit, in, in fact, to Wikimedians that they are in, in the middle of, of a battle that uh, is winning the persons in, the, in front of us that are uh, organized and they are working closely to, to close the knowledge, essentially. I'd add another challenge I see is the sustainability of the people who are really doing advocacy on behalf of this movement, particularly in terms of age. I know when we had a wiki advocacy meetup in Santiago this year, I think the average age of the room was 35 and up, mm -hmm. which is obviously not a bad thing. These are all people who come with I a hope. lot of expertise, <laughs> yes. But how are you going to get people who are 20 or students or even younger to start talking to librarians about the future of the open movement. How are you going to get them interested in contract negotiations and these things that really matter? Um, just to address that, uh, labor was one of the issues that we had flagged as well. Um, that cross that cuts these, that 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 cuts across uh, many of these and. We have discussed continuing the virtual workshops, and labor may be one that we take up. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, continue to what your point, actually, because um, I agree that actually bringing new generation is uh, an issue. Mm -hmm. But exactly at the, at the same time, we also discussed during that meeting that actually keeping people with experience, because we also saw gaps in terms of like growing into the role, having more experience. And so we don't manage to get young people to have the confidence to come into that movement, which is really difficult in advocacy to build confidence and knowledge. But we also have difficulties of keeping people with that specific expertise that are for professional development or sometimes, honestly, um, uh, financial aspect are going to another position in mm -hmm. one of the GAFAM, which is also an issue because, for instance, in the chapters uh, in Europe, we either don't have policy position or we can only fund the junior positions and we cannot manage middle, middle professionals to come in those positions or even uh, more experienced senior professionals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I would 
maybe suggest to reframe the challenge a bit? Like, it's not just getting young people, but we need to get the, the dialogue going between generations of advocates and make sure that this whole know-how transfer goes back and forth. We're now next year approaching WSIS plus 20. And I'm trying now to reach out to the old dinosaurs who actually moderated this stuff on behalf of civil society 20 years ago. And I think it would be hugely uh, helpful to actually have their insights into the power plays of the time and then maybe the power plays that, would, that has been going on the past 20 years to kind of understand and also in the copyright area, it's the same. It's the same thing. Like how how this debate moved from one organization to the next, and uh, how this affected um, strategies that could work, could not work. If you just bring in new people with like um, idealistic ideas, that's not enough. Thank you. To, to add to that, I think it's not so... Oh, yes, my name. Uh, Maya Drabczyk and I from Warsaw Centrum Cyfrowe. So we are, and I think, and do uh, thank that Alec mentioned before. So yes, we are connected. Uh, but uh, to add to that, I think it's not only about young voices. I agree very much with that. But I think it's also about voices of researchers and academics themselves. Because now we are discussing how to speak on their behalf. And we need them to speak on their own behalf and share their stories. Because if you're talking to policymakers, I think what they really get is a personal story. It's a story of a researcher who said, sorry, I couldn't do my research. I wanted to do it in a cross-border um, context. It was impossible because of the privacy issues, especially if you go uh, beyond, in our context, because uh, beyond the EU. And uh, GDPR, uh, copyright, impossible. This is my story. Uh, I, we are now finishing a centrum on behalf of Knowledge Rights 21. That's another um, entity and project uh, focusing on, on um, um, right to knowledge and sharing of knowledge. And we are, uh, we've talked to more than 40 researchers, European researchers and academics. And exactly, they want to they want to have a cross-border um, the ability to do their research in a cross-border context. But other thing that they mentioned, that they don't want to deal with all the advocacy questions, they don't want to deal with the copyright questions, they don't want to, they, they just want to do their research. So I think one of the biggest challenges for us in this room here uh, is how to persuade them to be more active and really speak up and have them uh, say in the in the conversation, so change the mindset. And I think uh, this is very interesting. What what all of you are saying, if we put together, for instance, what you Maya said, what Yuziski said, is on one hand, I always feel it was already hard to talk with, with for instance, researchers about copyright, mm -hmm. and we took all this time to train them. I recently had this experience. I was working with a, on educational resource about AI with an amazing Polish teacher who told me that over, let's say, five to 10 years, she became a really, she feels good copyright expert. And she's able to advise other teachers and, and feels really confident. And at the moment, she started feeling confident on what she thought it's a key issue. So it was moved a bit aside. And now she has to understand how generative models work, what's bias, ethics. And she said that it's overwhelming. So I feel the challenge is that this complicates the picture really a lot. We're suddenly not working on one issue, but three or four. So I hope maybe, Ivan, you can say a bit more in a moment, like how do you deal with the, all these issues? But then I think maybe the new generations bring this advantage. Maybe they see it differently. I think it's not just we need younger people, but maybe they will bring a different perspective, I hope. Mm -hmm. And then skills, yeah. Uh, do, do, please go ahead then. Well, I, I, uh, I could continue from this. Um, I'm Tuve. Yes, I'm Tuve Ørsted uh, from Avon Glam, Finland, Helsinki. Um, it's also where you come from, where, where you are, and how far you come in, in uh, openness. I think what you're doing now comes from a really, really good time uh, for many countries around the world. But in a place where Finland, where openness has always been like 
like open as default kind of country. And uh, 10, 15 years ago, we went really far with open culture. And so we relaxed. And now we see that economic situation, political situation, uh, new technologies then, like AI makes these cultural institutions aware and worried and skeptic. And suddenly we are moving backwards. So we have to take, take up the fight again. So yes, this is also. Absolutely agree with what you did, what you said. Um, what I, what I have like a strategy in Mexico where we have the worst copyright law in the world, I think, yeah. 100 years, um, is that uh, first for the younger people is have like a, a strategy of translation of the legal uh, vocabulary to make understandable that, that I think is one of the key tasks that Commons is doing, Creative Commons is doing. And I think we, we need to insist in, in simplify all the legal matters to be very understandable to the young people. But uh, young people arrive to a world that all the things are are built, you know? So for, for talk with young people uh, or reach young people, like an strategy, we talk with elder people of the institutions, <laughs> like especially the lawyers, uh, because uh, they grow in a world that it's no, absolutely no. You can do anything. You you you, you are you have forbidden everything. That that's the mindset of the elder people in in at least in the biggest university of Mexico. I work at closely with them to make a mega project around licensing, free open licensing. And the, the crucial work that was talk with elder people who not understand any word about rights about because they grow in a, in a world without rights essentially, and the, they understand that the, the the value of the openness from a perspective not dogmatic, and we tr we we achieve it. Uh, the main repository of UNAM, which is the largest university in Mexico, was changed to Creative Commons license. Near to half million of, of files was changed automatically because the decision of one close elder people group. <laughs> so I think in the future, the young people that arrive to make research and investigation in human and you will find a more open database i think I, it's, it's a, a future that it's very prom very, very exciting yeah my, my name is douglas from the user group in uganda i also represent the east african region and thematic hub so uh, my submission to this is on the emerging issues uh, so what i foresee is integration because ai is new it's coming up with its own standards but since you say this session is about providing answers, I think what we can do is uh, maybe stick to what has worked well for us across the board. And by across the board, I mean across the different players in the, in the area, because I know you've, you've mentioned quite a number of <laughs> organizations that you represent. Mm -hmm. So if we are able to uh, stick to what has worked well for us, if it's reliable data sources, then we stick to that. And then at the point of integration, we can as well stick to that, like how let's have AI tools have such and such uh, policies or procedures that have worked well for us. So that is what I would submit. And then as far as, um, yeah, you know, I have also an interest in, in, in youth and sustainability. So if we can be able to uh, be open up and have open discussions about this, then we can be able to have an advocacy mechanisms but then by open discussions, <laughs> I mean, uh, I can just give an example from the experience that I've had here. So we've had an advocacy by the CEE Youth, mm -hmm. CEE Youth Group, mm -hmm. yeah? So there has been open discussions about that and we realized that if this has happened openly, then you can be able to connect with other, 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 other initiatives that are happening like across the different areas in the movement. So if we can keep the discussions open, we can be able to openly share and see what can be uh, integrated in one way or the other as far as advocacy efforts are concerned. Integrated or even uh, customized with different contexts. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Rebecca from Creative Commons. Um, but prior to Creative Commons, I actually worked for a national library consortia in Canada. So would do sort of the buying on behalf of all the academic libraries with the large vendors. And one thing I just want to add to the conversation about w working with the vendors is that uh, I think in a large part, the librarians are bought in, but then the vendors go directly to uh, senior administrators at the university and they just bypass the librarians and then aim to work with those senior administrators. So it really is about um, that storytelling and that narrative and coming up with a set of principles so that it can be shared throughout the institution in terms of making those decisions on content. Because what's going to happen next is, uh, I think we already saw it, Taylor and Francis has sold their library to Microsoft for AI use. Um, that's going to keep happening and we will lose some kind of access to it. Um, and I'm quite concerned, I think, from the Creative Commons perspective about um, uh, uh, stuff not being in the commons because folks will get scared of openly licensing their work because they just don't know what's going to happen in the future. So um, I think we need to consider quite carefully the different ways that we can make it safe and comfortable for people to continue to openly license their work um, and then have a sense of what's going to happen. So we're thinking a lot at Creative Commons about finding some space in between this idea of opt-in or opt-out. So there might be a spectrum of choice and saying, you know, maybe uh, I would like to put my material in the comments, but uh, I don't want it to be uh, used in this way and really starting to almost establish a new set of norms and how we behave together um, in sharing in the internet, almost like happened at the beginning of Creative Commons 20 years ago. So my instinct is almost like if we could find a way as this community to come up with a, a set of principles that really does make sense for everyone and then we can say, you know, this is what the community believes in and this is what we're trying to work on together as like small steps that that would be quite beneficial for folks to rely on. Uh, I see one of the challenges of how can, uh, which stands be uh, before us is how can we influence policy makers how can we um, help uh, um, open uh, knowledge activists in countries like Russia, like North Korea, etc.? One of the challenges. I'm happy you mentioned it. Um, I will sort of respond with some thoughts I've been having. I, I live in Poland. Uh, fortunately, there is no war in Poland, but there's war very close to us in Ukraine. And um, I, I also have these thoughts that um, I learned how to talk about openness and about sharing in, in I would say, at least in my region, a different world. I, of course, uh, there, there are conflicts happening all over the world, but this is very close to me. I feel... Um, to make this more specific, you know, I see how a lot of discussions from, for instance, on digital will be discussions about cybersecurity, about military uses, about uh, investments will be, I don't know, in drones. And I ask myself how to avoid a situation where these are uh, probably important for our security, but still very difficult issues sort of paint the broader picture around the internet, around digital technologies, around research and innovation. I, I, I don't have an answer to this, but, but I feel very much so. I would even say this is not just about uh, countries uh, that are uh, dictatorial regimes, uh, but also in democracies who are maybe dealing with these very big challenges. That's that question, what's the new narrative? I don't think we can talk in the same way I started doing it in 2005. Um. Uh, hello. Uh, in fact, I have two Can questions. You introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Kiro Simonovsky, and I'm from the Macedonian Wikipedia community. Ah. Uh, I've been involved in uh, many discussions on uh, advocacy efforts regarding uh, changes in legislation and uh, uh, how it may affect the future of the Wikimedia movement. 
so what I'm interested to know is, uh, uh, have you ever considered uh, how the uh, changes in the shape of the new forms of uh, free knowledge affect uh, all these advocacy efforts that we have to pursue in order to make sure that uh, the content that is produced uh, may be free on uh, the Wikimedia projects? And the second question is, uh, what is your opinion about uh, the free content uh, generated with uh, copyrighted uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, do you think this is something which may harm uh, uh, our movement or uh, make uh, some restrictions on uh, how to disseminate uh, uh, the content uh, created in that way? Because, for example, if you go on Wikimedia Commons, you can already find a questionnaire in which uh, there is a question whether uh, some parts of uh, uh, the media was produced uh, using uh, generative AI or not? Ivan, you wanted to... No, I was trying to, to answer the jury's question. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are doing in Mexico is organizing trainings. Uh, I, I understand that you quoted the non-democratic countries as an example, but what, what we need to work in our countries where we have democracies too. Uh, we are we are organizing courses and training, literally. Uh, for an example, we are we are trying to organize a formal uh, course with the Supreme Court teams because they are out absolutely out of the the materials and the way that we, we see the world. And when we share our perspective, they say, "Oh, it's very cool," <laughs> you know. But but they 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 are out of our understanding so it's very valuable to organize training and courses secondly we are organizing now in wikimedia mexico a, a course with a university which is called flaxo it's a latin american faculty of social sciences and it's like a open and free knowledge one two three course for decision making persons so many people are entering now to that course because uh, people from the government not have that the perspective of open and free and they will have in that course like a very broad topic and introductory topics around our world yeah that's all thank you Thank you. And I wanted to follow up on the policy question that you had in terms of advocacy, because especially when the op with the open access to research movement, we've been advocating for public access to publicly funded research for almost 20 years now. And while in um, much of our work, we don't spell out what type of license specifically, but we explain what we want the research to be able to be used for. And so that's basically CC BY, which would allow for, for reuse. And in the US, we had uh, a landmark legislation come out, or, or a landmark um, executive order come out in 2002, which will make all publicly funded research um, coming out of U US federally funded agencies open access with a CC BY license. Uh, so that's going to be a, a huge change from previous policies. And um, many open access advocates are, are using these same methods to advocate for public access around the world in, the, in this way. I mean, not to bring the conversation to too much of a practical level, but like, frankly, when we're talking about things like open infrastructure, it, it really does come down to sustainability and funding as well without knowing how to pay for it. Like this idea of open infrastructure constantly being grant funded, it's really an oxymoron. So I think that is a big roadblock for us as well. Um, because until like the pipes are sustained, the content that goes through the pipes, you know, it's it's never really going to meet what we need it to meet. So, I don't really know the answer to that or how we have a solution for that. But that it seems to be a, a, a an issue that uh, we need to kind of work with uh, funders and other partners to to resolve. Mm. If I, if I can say just a bit, I think the issue of infrastructure is very interesting. It sort of deserves a separate session. I think it's not a big topic at Wikimania because Wikimedia has the issue solved. I know we have a lot of conversations whether the code is good enough, but in general, it's, it seems to be really sustainable in comparison with some other projects. But indeed, 
For instance, I, the, it's interesting how the pandemic was this really interesting one. No, I want to start by saying the first thought I have is that this is not really my issue. It's like, it's a condi but I learned that it's a condition. I think a lot of this is people, you could say, my business is not dealing with concentrations of power. I devoted myself to promoting free knowledge strategies. But then we realize we need to deal with this. And I think with infrastructure is the same. Pandemic was this moment in Poland, all the institutions obviously needed to go online. And the quickest solution was the commercial one, the, because they have everything there. They have basically the servers, the cloud, uh, the people to go to institutions and get the deals. We need to also admit it was very useful. It was a um, sort of valuable resource. But what is a bit shocking for me, I think there are resources in the public sector. Academic institutions are quite strong institutions. But yes, probably some combination of not enough imagination, not enough capacity, limited in the end resources, leads to this situation where we don't have alternatives. I remember I was very moved um, during the pandemic. There's a... Um, I think she's Belgian Turkish researcher Seda Gurses, and she said about this in the podcast. I think it's a failure that Belgian and Benelux, uh, also Dutch universities, cannot get together and build a video platform. It's not that complicated. I think it's not, but they don't have it. So you're right. It's a topic that I think is now becoming more and more popular, and the solutions are not easy. And just to say, there, of course, there are many issues around equity as well, because in the global south. Open infrastructure is definitely much more supported by institu institutions and governments, and yet the models from the global north, the commercial models, are coming in and putting those sustainable models in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. We're curious uh, to hear anyone who hasn't yet spoken, maybe have a different perspective, maybe there's another issue. We're going through a lot of issues here, which I hope is Fine. So any additional thoughts as we're nearing the hour will be welcome. Daria, please. An obvious one, but Great. I, I'll, <laughs> I'll speak it. It strikes me that the level of complexity of the knowledge that the advocates need to have to advocate for this and a crystal ball as well to like know what the implication would be of sharing the knowledge to like allay the fears. Uh, I don't know, I mean, yes, uh, we are all learning and uh, developing and gaining more knowledge, but I see this as a bit of a challenge for sure, especially, yeah, it seems like our job was a bit easier when it was just about teaching copyright. <laughs> but your organization, I always think uh, you're doing a very good job navigating, uh, learning. Do you have any uh, solutions that you're developing? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, I have a team of um, program coordinators and I sort of feel for them because they're supposed to be coordinators, facilitators for like others to do the work, but it seems like they have to become experts as well. And I don't know how to provide that whilst they're also like we are doing it, but it's very DIY, you know, not um, uh, we are learning by doing and not and if I did it properly, that would become their job rather than coordinating partnerships and like doing more uh, connecting work. Mm -hmm. You see? So mm -hmm. we are doing, but I don't know if that's the best way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes? Hello, I'm Heike from Wikimedia Deutschland, and I'm trying to do advocacy work on education. And um, we have spoken about the people advocating, but um, what are new strategies to approach policymakers, or what are your experiences? Because at the same time, like we as advocators need new knowledge, and it's really complex. On this policymaking level, it's also about yeah, people re don't know, and they they also have to catch up. And I think your example about in Mexico is really striking to make these courses for decision makers. But I was wondering, um, how do you get the decision makers to come to your course, like to your <laughs> events, and uh, what kind of new strategies do we need to approach policymakers? Uh, 
Um, well, in the past, I, I worked in different organizations uh, related to advocacy and policy uh, issues. And actually, uh, well, I, um, I can speak for those positions. Um, we've tried to actually develop programs with UN organizations, like, for instance, um, to advance our goals and to make sure that people would come. And for instance, I'm thinking of uh, WIPO, like to try to actually develop like educational program with them where, where we, they would talk about exceptions and limitation to copyright issue. Obviously, I'm not saying that this is always working, and, and, uh, but if you're actually going to secretaries, like UN secretaries, sometimes it's a way of also trying to develop those programs over years, and it, it takes years to get there, obviously. It's a very long-term uh, project, but it can be the way of trying to get to those people because, for instance, when you're looking at WIPO, you do have an immense uh, program for taking classes for all the delegations. And if you manage to get your goal there, like to have those programs developed with them, then you have a chance to, to actually reach out of all the delegation together with on, only a single class. So that's... Um, Again, it's really long term, but then uh, and it's really hard. But I think it's a good strategy sometimes to collaborate with them. But it also means sometimes trade offs as well. So, uh, Ivan, you also wanted to speak. Yeah, it's our first attempt. So we have now 30 persons inscribed. So I hope we can ho have more. We used the previously networking uh, sources that we had at the chapter and the uh, own university. But at, at this point, we have uh, inscribed at least 10 persons who are decision makers of the new government. So uh, we are very amazed of that. And we hope that we, we will have good outcomes. But there's no a single strategy. We are moving in many communities. We are spreading the word around the net, the, the social media. And the, the own foundation is supporting us with the communications team spreading the word. Um, one thing is a bit negative is that we don't have scholarships. So that's the only main thing that is the, the, the challenge because Wikimedians wants to attend the course, but we don't have scholarships at this point. And I think to say on, on the policy work, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it's really about the relationships with, with decision makers. And that really does take years um, in building up those relationships and building up the trust so that policymakers will, you know, believe what you're saying. And what we have found in some of our work at Creative Commons is um, sort of showing them that we can help them meet their own goals. So for example, uh, if a certain government or even institution says they want to meet the SDG goals, for example, we will say, you know, actually, did you know that having an open policy or open science policy helps you to meet those goals. So really trying to identify when they're doing policy development work. It all happens on a cycle, right? Like when are they going to be um, updating or changing the policy and then getting in front of them? And they're at different meetings than we are at. Um, so I think that's also important to, to sort of expand where this community goes and our reach, like going to COP, for example, for climate work. Um, so we do have a tendency of talking you know, to ourselves, and, and that is really good. But I think with the policy and decision makers, it is going to be about expanding the network significantly and finding those champions. I think it's time to finish so that you can either take a break or run to the next session. Thank you very much. I know that we went through a lot of topics. Um, I hope it didn't feel like we're rushing. I think it gave, it's like a kaleidoscope that was interesting to see the, all the elements. For us, this was very useful to get some more feedback. As uh, Melissa mentioned, we will be doing an online consultation phase. So you can either tell us right now that you would like to take part. You can write, find us, write us an email or find us on Instagram because we're so young. <laughs> uh, or, or look out for the message that there's such a thing happening. We'll be very glad to have your input. Thank you very much.